Hi, I wanted to let you know that I have a brand new, totally free masterclass available and I'd love if you wanted to check it out. It's about an hour long and it goes over three simple things that every dog owner needs to know in order to teach a dog quickly and easily without pain, force, a major time investment or fancy equipment. When you register, you'll also get a free 20 page ebook all about what I call the dog training triad. You can find it at anniegrossman.com slash masterclass. And now for something completely different. Hi, my name is Annie Grossman and I'm a dog trainer. This podcast is brought to you by School for the Dogs, a Manhattan-based facility I own and operate along with some of the city's finest dog trainers. During this podcast, we'll be answering your questions, geeking out on animal behavior, discussing pet trends, and interviewing industry experts. Welcome to School for the Dogs podcast. A few years ago, a cousin gave me a pile of books about dogs, all these used books that I think he'd gotten at a garage sale. They were all from the 90s, and um, one was called What Do Dogs Know? One was The Paw Prints of History, Dogs in the Course of Human Events. One was called uh, The Intelligence of Dogs. And I kind of flipped through the books and thought, you know, okay, there's there's some dated information here, and there was some decent info here and there, but overall I found the books a little... I guess a little boring, and I put them on my shelf of books that are uh, dated and <laughs> but possibly interesting for future reference relating to all things dogs and dog training. I, I, I have a lot of books in this category, or not even books that are dated, just like I like old weird books about dogs. I like thinking about not only how people think about dogs now, but in the past. I guess I didn't really consider these books too much or the author, although I did remember seeing that he was a doctor, that he was a professor of psychology, and so there was a little bit of dissonance there for me because I thought, well, if this person is a professor, you know, I would think therefore a researcher, then we should be taking his work pretty seriously. I think that's like a bias we have when we see that someone has a doctor in front of their name or, or a bias I have. But of course, you can be a doctor and not be a great writer. <laughs> you could be a great writer and not be a doctor. You could know a lot about a subject and have no degree. You could have a degree and write a book that is not well-researched. But again, I thought, you know what? These were written... 20, 30 years ago, things have changed. These aren't necessarily dog training books. They're just kind of general interest books about dogs and not meant to be the latest and the greatest of uh, canine research. Anyway, books went on the shelf. Then, a few months ago, I was trying to find uh, an old cover of the New York Times book review that my father did. My father was a, an illustrator and he often did illustrations for the New York Times and particularly for their book review section and there was this one image he had done of people being walked by their dogs and I um, was trying to find this old illustration of his and I found that it was actually part of an entire section uh, in 1994 that the New York Times book review did about dogs and my dad had illustrated the whole section and in this uh, whole um, part of this uh, June 5th 1994 book review section that I found there was um, a review of Stanley Corrin's 1990 I guess 1994 book the intelligence of dogs and there's above it there's an article called how to wear rover close to your heart <laughs> that's about knitting dog hair so I found this old book review uh, and I'm just going to read some of it it's by Sarah Boxer she starts out quoting from the book you need a large bath towel a small blanket or some other heavy cloth of a similar size 
first make sure that the dog is awake and reasonably active and then let it sniff the towel. Then with a quick smooth motion, you may want to practice once or twice without the dog present, throw the towel over the dog's head so that its head and front shoulders are completely covered. Start the stopwatch and watch silently. If the dog frees itself in 15 seconds or less, score five. In 15 to 30 seconds, score four. In 30 to 60 seconds, score three. In one to two minutes, score two. If the dog has not removed the towel after two minutes, score one. The dog with the lowest score, the one wearing a towel on its head, may well be on the way to proving its native stupidity, according to the canine intelligence test offered by Stanley Corin in The Intelligence of Dogs. But what about the examiner, the person lofting a towel over his dog's head for no good reason? Mr. Corin's intelligence test is a set of small taunts, turning over a tin can on a morsel of food to see how long it takes your dog to get the food, calling out the word refrigerator to see if your dog answers to that name, rearranging the furniture in the house to see whether the dog notices. Is it an accident that this intelligence test, this battery of little indignities heaped on the dog of your choice to see how it copes with the utter incomprehensibility and capriciousness of human ways, looks looks more like the Book of Job than the Stanford Binet? Probably not. Mr. Corrin seems to think that dogs are our servants and we are their gods. Quote, dogs were designed and selected by humans to fulfill the needs and desires of our species, he writes. They are perfectly adapted to our lives because we created them to be so. We brought them in from the wild and bred them for the characteristics we liked best. Skipping ahead a little bit, Um, in this article. I'll post the full thing in the show notes. But neither sweet temperament nor raw intelligence means anything without the fear of God. It's not enough for you to see your dog as your servant. You must get your dog to accept you as its pack leader. For this, you must periodically, quote, push the dog over on its side and stare into its eyes. You must occasionally take an object or some food away from the dog. And, quote, when the dog is resting in a favorite spot, you should make it move from time to time. Whatever it takes, show your dog that you are an unpredictable predictable force of nature, a terrible god who must be obeyed. And then the article ends with this long quote from Stanley Coran on how to pet a dog. While, quote, while talking in a soothing manner, saying the dog's name frequently, have it sit or stand in front of you, take its head in both of your hands, stroke or fondle its ears, neck, and muzzle in this two-handed manner, looking into the dog's eyes as you do. Next, slide both hands down the dog's neck, back and sides. Lightly slide your hands over the dog's chest and then all the way down. <laughs> each of the dog's front legs finish by again grasping the dog's head momentarily and saying the dog's name in a happy voice end quote and then the writer writes and then pray that your god is not nearly as kinky as you all right um i found this book review so interesting because it sort of encapsulated like what i wanted to what i what i couldn't quite figure out how to express when I first when I first gave those books by uh, Stanley Corrin like a cursory glance which was like there was a point of view here of of us being masters to dogs which seems weird to me and you know outdated but also just sort of a weirdness in the way that it's telling us to interact with dogs that feels very like human centric like us versus them rather than thinking about us as kinds of animals that are operating within the same laws of learning and like who needs to be instructed on how to pet their dog it's not that he's wrong it's just i feel like he's writing with a point of view that's very very different than mine and it's and it's one that I, I have some problems with. Then a few weeks ago, I, but at the very least, I thought that, that the books and the article, it was all kind of an interesting time capsule of writing about dogs in the 1990s. Then like a week ago, I saw an article in Psychology Today that caught my eye. It was called, Why Does a Reward During Training Change a Dog's Behavior? And the first sentence of the article was, everyone knows that giving a dog a reward for responding in the correct way during training 
changes the behavior. And I, right away, I thought, really? First of all, does everybody know that? Because uh, I work with a lot of people where it seems like this is actually news to them. But more than that, you know, to get technical, uh, everyone knows that giving a dog a reward for responding in the correct way during training changes the behavior. Well, a reward, what is a reward? That's, t- that's too uh, vague of a term for most dog trainers who I know who prefer to talk about reinforcers rather than rewards because what might be rewarding to me might not be rewarding to you. But colloquially, okay, fine, we can talk about rewards. That didn't trip me up too much. He goes on about, um, about to talk about basically operant conditioning, except he doesn't refer to operant conditioning, but he refers to this new study of puppies and dogs who had something to do with flipping over a cup. I didn't quite follow what he was, was saying, but basically that these studies, uh, according to him, prove that dogs learn by the consequence of their actions and that, like, I think if they... I think what the study is showing is like if they flip over a cup one time and there's a treat under it, then the next time they will be more likely to go to that cup to flip it over rather than going to another cup. He sums it up, though, at the end saying, so it seems like the mystery of how rewards serve as an effective means of training dogs is solved because a very simple strategy has been wired into canines. It says, if something you have done has given you a reward, repeat it. If not, try something else. It is a remarkably simple bit of behavioral programming, but it works, and it allows humans to successfully use rewards to train dogs. So I read this and I thought, what? Is he saying like that, you know, Operant conditioning has just been proven. Is he saying this is brand new, that like behaviors that are reinforced are more likely to happen again? In he's saying it, is, is that what he's saying in this kind of roundabout way that sounds like it's a discovery and that like, <laughs> you know, reinforcement is something that we do to dogs by giving them rewards as opposed to reinforcement exists even if humans have nothing to do with it i mean behaviors are reinforced by the environment by other dogs by god knows what i i just found this last paragraph so confusing and lo and behold uh i said who wrote this and it was written by stanley corin So I found some of these old books that I had of his and I flipped through them just a little bit. And there's just a lot of stuff like, like, like this. It's, this is an excerpt called from What Do Dogs Know? Compared to their sense of smell, dogs seem to pay a lot less attention to their sense of taste. Apparently, they believe that if something fits into their mouths, then it is food, no matter what it tastes like. In this, however, they are wrong. I mean, it's this kind of writing that's like uh, guessing at what dogs think. And I don't know, apparently they believe that if apparently to who? I, uh, I mean, I, I feel like maybe I'm being like a niggling jerk by saying all this, but I'm, I'm just like speaking out loud my, my thoughts as I read this stuff. Uh, here's another excerpt. This is this excerpt is showing um the 10 smartest dog breeds, which is like another kind of just like, it's like, it's so boilerplate, but that's not even what bothers me about it. It's like the the kind of thing you expect to read about dogs, but it just always rubs me the wrong way. Dogs are your individuals. You're going to find varying degrees of intelligence in different kinds of dogs and different kinds of dogs, different kinds of breeds might have intelligence that are different from one another. It's what and what about dogs that don't fall into a specific breed? So I got kind of curious about who Stanley Corin is. According to his Wikipedia page, he is a psychology professor, neuropsychological researcher, and writer on the intelligence, mental abilities, and history of dogs. He works in research and instructs in psychology at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, British Columbia. He writes for Psychology Today in the feature series called Canine Corner. Um, okay, so now we know a lot about Stanley Corin, uh, which leads me to my most recent encounter with Stanley Corin, which is another article he wrote this month called A Quick Fix for a Barking Dog. 
here is here is simple way to temporarily control excessive barking by a dog okay there is a typo in this uh, subtitle they have here anyway the article goes on to describe how um, Dr. Corin's friend was complaining to him that the dog, his dog Chester was barking and his friend says, well, at first I just told him to stop barking. I mean, I sort of yelled at him something like, no, stop that. Or maybe it got to the point where I was yelling, shut up, damn it. Uh, so I went on YouTube where I demonstrated how you stop barking by standing next to the dog and using your hand to smack a dog under its muzzle just hard enough so that the dog's uh, jaws clapped together for a moment that shut him up for a few seconds but when I stepped away so that Chester was out of smacking range he began to bark again and then uh, Corin writes using punishment to control a dog's behavior is not the best choice despite the fact that if you consult internet sources like YouTube most of the rest recommended techniques to control barking have a punitive aspect okay so reading this I thought Mm, this is talking about punishment in sort of a broad way because, for instance, is he saying that him yelling at the dog was punishing because punishing the behavior of the dog barking because maybe the dog was actually found, you know, liked being talked to and it, so if the behavior wasn't going away, then it wasn't really being punished by the yelling. Uh, it was perhaps being reinforced by the yelling. And then uh, certainly he is talking about, I guess, that hitting the dog would be punishment the way that this guy, it's, uh, I don't know, again, a little weirdly worded. I'm, I'm maybe just like not the biggest fan of, of uh, Stanley Korn's writing. Anyway, I clicked where it says punishment, though. It's underlined, highlighted in this article. I clicked punishment and it goes to a Psychology Today page that is like a thousand words long. Uh, it says punishment is the imposition of a penalty in response to an offense and it takes many forms. An eye for an eye is one of the strongest human instincts and one that can be difficult for both individuals and societies to overcome. But decades of evidence show that reciprocating harm is not always the best course of action either for the offender or the offended. And it goes on and on again. It's like pages and pages long. And I thought, okay, maybe the problem here isn't Stanley Corn. It's the fact that this was published at all and published by a place that has this like huge entry on when you click on the word punishment in like their own personal database of like definitions, I guess. And nowhere does it say punishment decreases behavior, the technical <laughs> definition on punishment. And instead it's sort of like talking about how punishment is morally you know reprehensible rather than the fact is like punishment is part of life punishment exists we can be punished by our, our environment punishment isn't just something that happens in relation to an offense i mean psychology today isn't this isn't like psychology something that falls under under behavioral science like shouldn't they be straight on this stuff i mean there's just so much more to be said about punishment that has nothing to do with evaluating it as good or bad punishment can be very mild punishment can be very effective if i burn my hand on the stove that's punishing and um because it's going to keep me from probably touching the stove again and in that case punishment is you know that's a good thing that it goes hand in hand you know negative punishment and positive reinforcement are you know are back and forth that are happening all the time behaviors that are being positively reinforced can go hand in hand with behaviors that are being negatively punished and uh, okay again maybe i'm just getting overly geeky here about this stuff but i i got to that point in the article and i thought maybe they we're going to turn around here he's talking about these antiquated methods that we see on youtube and he's going to now talk about the more up-to-date methods but Instead, he goes on to talk about how you can copy what wolves basically do in the wild, uh, which is to um, silence your dog by grabbing their collar, squeezing their muzzle shut with your hand, and saying in what he says should be a businesslike and unemotional tone, the word quiet, repeating this maneuver over and over again. 
this article ended up being met with a lot of anger from basically anybody who knows better. Today, it looks like it was edited so that it now uh, takes out the part about how you should grab your dog's nose and just has the part about how you should say the word quiet, which is good. I'm glad they've taken out this information that otherwise could really lead to some people being bit by their dogs, but I'm still puzzled how this ended up in a magazine to begin with. I mean, I'm puzzled and yet I'm not because there's so much misinformation out there. It's just like, yeah. But before they put up this edited version, they did approach Dr. Mark Beckoff to write a response, probably because they were inundated by dozens of people like me writing in and saying, like, why did you publish this? And the response was really great. Beckoff's response was clear-headed and uh, really rooted in science and uh, filled me with hope. So I called Dr. Beckoff and I will be sharing my interview with him next week. Make sure to tune in. Since we're talking both about the early 90s and attempting to read your dog's mind and thoughts, I wanted to share this clip from Conan O'Brien uh, from 1993. This is something I love a lot. It's with a young Louis C.K., Robert Smigel, and Adam Sandler. Hello. <laughs> All right, my next guests say that dogs have more to say than we think. In their new book, What I'm Telling You, they explain how a dog's gestures are a means of communication. Please welcome dog experts Tim Fisher and Bill Connolly. Okay, thank you. Okay. There you go. How are you? Yeah, uh, you guys, uh, these are very nice looking dogs, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys, uh, you guys have a theory. I, I flipped through the book. I didn't have time to read it, but I flipped through the book. And, and you guys, but you guys basically believe that uh, dogs are communicating all the time. Well, that's, that's essentially our, uh, our book, Conan. Uh, through body language and various gestures, these dogs are sending signals to their masters. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, people assume that dogs do certain things because of instincts, but it's really, it's not that simple. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you've obviously you brought some dogs here, very fine-looking dogs. Uh... Right. This one here is uh, Randy. Can mm -hmm. you get a shot of this big guy? Yeah. Hey, that's great. Well, can you give, us an, give us an example of, of how okay, he's communicating? Well, okay, well, I'll give you an example. For this, for example, this fellow Randy, he'll walk in a circle whenever I stand up and appear to be leaving the room. Mm -hmm. And uh, this may seem like some sort of an odd, cryptic gesture, but all he's really trying to say is, please don't leave me. I love you. I want to play. Where are you going? And it's important to understand that mm -hmm. and let him know with a simple pat on the head that it's OK and you're going to be there for him. OK. Now, I, I, so one problem that a lot of people have is uh, dogs that go to the bathroom in the house. It's a very common problem. It's very common, it's very problem, common with yes. teacup here. Mm -hmm. and, uh... <laughs> When uh, Teacup does this, what she's trying to say is, I made you something. Look, it's a present. It's all I have to give to show you that I love you. And you have to try to understand that that's, that's showing love. You don't want to punish that. You don't want to punish love. But on the other hand, sometimes the dog is doing it for a different reason. Sometimes he's saying, I'm angry. Where were you? I was all alone, and I had nothing else to do but this for you. I love you. Okay, now, now tell us, and what you is... can't encourage that behavior. I, I, I agree with that. Now, this little guy right here, I mean, he actually, yeah, what does he chihuahua. do? He looks, he looks pretty feisty, this chihuahua. Yeah, that little it? chihuahua, his name's Corky, and mm -hmm. he is pretty feisty. What, um, one of his uh, classic Corky move is, uh, here, let me hold him. For sure, you. there you go. Corky will jump on the couch, when it, but only when I'm on the couch. It's an odd thing, and, and I guess um, the main reason I think Corky does this is it's his way of saying, I'm one of you! I'm a human being like you. Mm -hmm. That's true, but the conflicting school of thought is that uh, that he's saying the opposite. He's saying, "You're one of me. We are both dogs. Let's watch dog TV together." 
right, 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 right. But the essential message is the same, which is we're equals. We mm -hmm. are the we same. Are you and me, we are the same. Right. No, I, I understand that. It's funny because I, I had a I had a cocker spaniel once, and he just loved the couch. He really oh, did it. Yeah. And uh, one day I moved it. And, uh, you know, he started barking at the couch. And I just interpreted, you know, this was his way of saying, I don't like change! Put it back the way it was! I don't like change! And I thought, well, this is, you know, very reasonable. This is what he wants. <laughs> it's not how a Cocker Spaniel sounds. No. <laughs> well, wait a minute. No. Well, wait a minute. What is... What do you mean that's not how a Cocker oh, Spaniel sounds? Is okay, that your name on the book? Whose name is on the book? Okay. Oh, well, no, it's, it's all right. It's all right. It it's like okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You wrote the book. I don't know. I no, mean, I just... No, I know. It's all right. It's okay. Listen, this is all very fascinating. I, I just wondered, does anybody in the audience have a question? Anyone at all? Uh, yes, you have a question. Yeah, uh... I, uh... <laughs> I have a dog that growls whenever I'm walking him, and uh, he, he sees another dog in the street, starts growling on him. Uh, is he being territorial? Uh, is he saying, don't pee there! That's where I'm going to pee! Go away! That's a good question. That's a very good question. Yeah. That's a very good question. And Actually, oh. sir, growling like that means that he's being protective of you. Hmm. That's, That's right. right. He's, he's, he's saying, this is my master. What the hell are you doing? You stay away from him. You stay he's away my from friend, my master. This belongs to me. You have if no business me, here. Keep walking, Arr. you. You Arr. will keep one foot in Arr. front of the other. Right. Well, yes. He's Very good, yes. Thanks so much for listening. You can support School for the Dogs podcast by subscribing, leaving a five-star review, telling your friends, and shopping in our online store. Learn more about School for the Dogs and sign up for lots of free training resources on our website, schoolforthedogs.com.